Minister Alliance High School is number one in the country. Okay, that's not new. Okay, 40, 45 A's, 45 A minus, and 36 B plus. So I calculated, I said 45 A's, 45 A minus, um, 90 plus 35, 36, ah, 120. I only need to be number one, top 120 out of 160. <laughs> so I said I'm gonna be top 20 in my class. And in four years, I never put any extra effort. I just made sure I was number 18, 19, 20, 18, 19. <laughs> no? Sure enough, the mathematics every year worked. 37 days, hard B plus, A minuses, no effort. Okay. Bang, go to university. Actually, I, was going, I wanted to be a doctor. Thank God I didn't, get, didn't become a doctor. Uh, not an offense to anyone doing medicine. But I missed it by one point. Those days, there was no parallel university. I think they used to take six or eight people for medicine. Very difficult. So my second choice was engineering. And uh, at that time, when you start university for engineering, the guy took, I don't know whether that book is still there, I'm very old, it's a book called Abbott Physics. You know it? And said, this one, you did it in Form 4. We are starting from a different position. And those days, you waited 18 months. So how do I, do I remember what happened in 18 months ago in Abbott Physics? Luckily, those days after, after so you had to stay one month in university before you change uh, your degree. You could be allowed to change. And from day one, I was in Nairobi University studying. I said, this is not for me, man. This is not for me. So I looked around. My brothers had done become. I said, ah, that's the one I'm going to do. So I applied because my marks were good. I joined become. But I'm going to come back to to that. So I was alliance. I was good in sports. So I was in the basketball team, rugby team, swimming team, but I was not the greatest of them. Okay? So I was not the best basketballer, I wasn't the best swimmer, but I made it the team. So was, again, 10, 15, you know, same thing <laughs> about, about that. And there's something that really, so when I finished Form 4, that really irritated me. And I want to show it to you sometime later, a uh, picture of my living certificate. So it's A, A minus, A, A, you know, really nice uh, living certificate thing. But the headmaster, Mr. Wagitu, wrote something there that stuck with me. He said, I'm an average student who works hard. And I could have said, it's written A, 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 eh? I, uh, I'm okay, you know, I'm top 20. Uh, and every other teacher wrote exceptional at sports, this, this, my housemaster wrote it. Uh, well, just on a side note, the guy who was my roommate from Form 1 to Form 4 was Kimani Chungwa, uh, the MP for Kikuyu. He was literally sleeping next to me for four years. Really nice guy and eventually became the house captain, uh, my house captain. But that aside, when I finished from four, so this is 1994. So I told you about my, my mom and you know how she made sure that uh, from, uh, from primary she was really following upon us. When, when we joined from one, that was the end of, of her teaching us or ever looking at my certificate. She has never looked at my certificate. Uh, I can see some pictures flowing. That's my mom there. That's us guys. That's the house we used to live in, in Kapenguria. Uh, that's my, my brothers would be a bit embarrassed if they saw that picture. Uh, <laughs> but I need to take by my dad, but that's typical growing up uh, in, in, in us. Uh, but just to give you an example about the second bit is around innovation. So in 1994, 
when we finished December, it's a great time. No, I, I never had any issues of not being able to go out. My folks were my since you joined high school. You're a man. They never looked at my certificates. They've never looked at my certificates ever. When I graduated, oh, you graduated. Okay. You did your master's. Ah, okay. It's been like that. <laughs> because from the time you were, uh, I started high school, they, they, they more left, left us alone. But it was in December 1994. And that's the same year. It wasn't called County of Nairobi, it was called City Council of Nairobi. Uh, did something which was before garbage collection used to happen. Truck used to come every day, put it, you know, every other two, three days. And the City Council used to collect garbage. There were metal tins those days, con uh, garbage uh, bins. That was a cool, cool life. That the month, they stopped collecting garbage. So we're in Langata many houses, and we are sitting as, we were five of us, and this had accumulated for like two weeks. So there's garbage everywhere. And we said, I said, man, I think let's, let's do something about this. So we decided, we were five of us, formed a company called Skip. Not very innovative, because it was Sitora, Chris, Eddie, Edwin, Ben. That was the name we called it. We took all our initials. And we went to a cyber cafe and did some um, printouts of uh, registration. We were charging 150 shillings a month for garbage collecting, and a friend of ours had a pickup. And we started garbage collecting, innovating around that. By February that year, we were the largest garbage collecting company in Kenya. We had over 3,000 houses. We were 18 years old. And that's when we started seeing money. And, you know, we used to go to carnival. It's good to have enjoy life when you're young. Yeah, we could really enjoy life, because we had money and we had a car. Um, and that was the first point about innovation and, that, and how we, we started. Then, the first place we started dumping that time was Dandora Dam Site. It was brand new. They actually used to pay us to take garbage to Dandora Dam Site. And they used to wash the pickup, and we used to come. We used to pick, pick garbage very early from 5.30 in the morning. So by 7.30, we were done. And we never used to hire anyone. We used to pick garbage ourselves. And what, was that, what that did is the churches and the women groups all said, these young boys of, of, uh, the, of Langata, we need to support them. So the church, the community came to support us. That's why we grew very, very, very quickly. Then we used to come back, buy chips, and started playing pool table, started playing pool. And I got really good at pool. Uh, I don't know if there's a pool table in campus here, but I'd, I think mentally I can still play it well. I don't know, like physically I can still play it as well as I used to. But then I used to stay on the table for six hours, you know, beating guy after guy after guy. And every time there was a 20 shillings entering the pool table, I realized I'm working actually for the owner of the pool table. So I decided to enter the pool table business. And I've not joined Compass. Really. By the time I joined Compass, we had over 40 pool tables. We were everywhere in most of the bars in Nairobi, uh, sharing revenue share uh, with them. And now we have a garbage collecting company and have a pool table business. It didn't end there. I met a very enterprising young man at that time. He was working, and he was working in procurement for government. He was called the late Mr. Onyango. And he saw us young people with a little bit of money. He said, yeah, I think you can do better than what you guys are doing. Let me help you enter this quotation business. So he told me to think about, I mean, he, to think about sanitary towels. What the sanitary towels? I didn't even know what that was that time. I said they needed that. So I went to Chumi, I looked, 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 and I found a company called Sun Towels. And I went to see them on Mombasa Road. They're just a new company. But cut a long story short, in a few months, I knew everything about sanitary towels. Maternity loop, lazy, regular terms. I became the largest sanitary supplier in this country. Uh, and 
that time I was 21 years old. Now, these are just giving examples about innovation and about situational awareness. Then, went to university, and I don't know the lecturers are the same way. Am I allowed to embarrass lecturers, students? You know, then the first lecture, I don't know whether it's that lecture or was it Nairobi University itself. I think, I'm not too sure, but I think universities have changed dramatically. Uh, because when I walked into that lecture, the guy spoke and everybody was writing notes. And he went on and on and on and everybody was writing notes and the lecture ended. I said, uh, that's it? So you enter, the guy dictates, you write notes. I said, I'm not going to class. So in four years, uh, again, situational awareness, I realized going to class in university that time might not be as beneficial. Let me work on my business and then focus on the exams. So I went to very few classes in university, to be honest. Uh, I compensated in my masters. But that time, I was doing business, enjoying life, and then I rediscovered, because all you just needed to do in university is don't get a supplementary. I knew that one, I'm not get a supplementary. <laughs> so then I knew that first, second year, there's no, it doesn't count to your degree. I don't know whether it counts today, today whether you get an upper first class or something like that. I changed. So in third year, I looked at took a step back, said, okay, how am I doing in, in school? So uh, all my, my mom, Max were 55, 58, barely passing again. This time I think I was like number 30, 40, not the top 15 there. So I realized, then I looked at my coursework. I was getting something like three out of 30, five out of 30, but my exam is 55. So I said, there's nothing wrong with my exams. So exam time, I'm good. I need to work on my coursework. So I didn't change anything in 30 and 40 about how I study. I just changed how I do. approach class and coursework. And I put effort. Uh, results came. I missed the first class by 2%. I got 68. I think first class is 70. I was like, damn, OK, not bad. Again, I fluked it through. Yeah? But it was about situation awareness, creati creativity, and uh, being aware of what uh, is, is happening. But then everybody, that time PwC, EABL used to come to university yeah, to, to convince you you should join uh, the university. And for me it was, why should I start working now? Because I said, you know, you'll get 30 days in a year. So I said, I'm going to take four months to university before I apply for a job. I'm not going to apply, I'm not going to do anything. And I, to be honest, I partied hard for, for four months. Then I saw an advert in the newspaper for Chumi saying for graduate management trainees. I applied. I took it to Chumi House. And it was among, I think, 300 or 400 other applications. And it was in the receiving base. So there were cabbages here and so much. And then CVs piled up. I put it there and said, let's see what happens. Luckily, they call me, and this is the second part of where it fundamentally changed who I am. Because when I joined Uchum as a graduate trainee, I was taken to different parts, but then I was given, uh, it was Nairobi West branch to run. So you're 23 years old around there. You've got the key of the store. You're the first one to enter, last one to leave. You're a CEO. You have had 67 staff members of the youngest. So from the you know, cashiers, the back office, the supervisors, the assistant The best part of it was you had a, you know, this radio thing. So me all 001 because you're the top guy in, in, in the branch. Eh? Really look cool. But I worked for six months without a single day off because supermarkets work every single day. And luckily to, to me, they took me to one place called South Africa to work for pick and pay for a few weeks. And that changed who I am today. Because when I went to South Africa, I realized a 
supermarket is a technology company. So you enter Nakumat or Tuskies, Nivers, you don't see technology. It is a technology company. From space management, category management, reorder levels, pricing, um, promotions, all that is technology. How you source, everything is based on technology. So I came back and said, I need to understand technology. And I researched, uh, and then I resigned. That was after, I think, seven months in Uchumi. And I went, luckily I had money, so I paid for my master's in the UK. It was a lot of money to, be, to go for a master's in 19, the UK then. And spent a year in the UK. But then the third thing that changed me was a professor. So the first lesson, the class that went, it's a nice uh, uh, lecture theater. It had a lot of technology. And this guy walked in, he had long hair, he was eating a burger and just having a Coke. And he was 28 years old and he was a professor. I said, wow. This is just the first thing. I was in a 28 year old professor. And the guy was eating a burger and, uh, you know, and that. And the first thing he said is, we're not here. He, he, he spoke. And I didn't realize he was teaching. Because I was my mindset of dictation. And the guy said, you know, what I'm saying is not, you don't have to take it. I'll say it. You can read somebody else to say it, but you give your own opinion. I've never been asked to give my own opinion in life. Critical thinking. And that changed who I am. In the UK, I never missed a class because I was enjoying learning for the first time and being able to express who I am. Even when I was doing the, my dissertation, it's during summertime, you know, you've got four months, five months of free time. But I was in the library six, seven hours every single day researching about what should be a research topic and so on and so forth. And for me, that critical thinking and learning something called front end loading. And my team know that in m -Pesa. If you come with an idea, you know, tech guys are really good. They build it, then they come and tell you. I don't know, before you build it, draw it for me. If you can't draw something and explain to me how it works, then you've not thought through it. Because once you start drawing it, then I add, then we add, and what? After that, you can build something quite easily. So that front end loading is so important, even in life, on how you look at things in it. So those are sort of my, the first, I just wanted to tell you about who I am and where I've come from. No any different from who you are. I think you've, been, you've seen some of the pictures uh, of who I am to what we are today. So if you see me with Satya, Microsoft CEO, or you see me you know, with the president, or with whoever, it's not, don't see that and not understand that there is a process to get it. And uh, to a point, so when I recruit somebody, and uh, you guys are gonna be in the job market soon, you know, the young guys these days, they want, they want success very quickly. So you're bright, you come, you know, after six months, you want a raise, okay? Maybe you deserve it, but maybe not. After a year, huh, the guy wants to become the head of department. I'm like, hey, you've just been here a year. You know, you have to earn your stripes. Guys, I'm not going anywhere, I'm 47, yeah? You, you can be 23, but you want to be the CEO of MPES. You have to, it, it'll take time. Yeah, it does take time. And I appreciate that process. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about patience as you, as, you, as you go. And these things are what have set me to who I am today. So I'm not uh, the person running for, for companies. I'm not, I'm two CEOs of two different companies. I'm, that's not who I am. Who I am is this person that I've, you've heard me talk about. You're just a simple average person. That's who I am and no any different from any, any, anyone that I saw sitting down uh, outside. If I change topics now and go to why it's exciting to be you guys, and I wish I could go back 20, it's more than 20 years, because I think, see how many people are, is there any more than 25 on, years old on undergrad? I don't think so. Eh? 
26. Most people are younger than that for the undergrad rather than maybe uh, uh, masters and postgrad students. Which means uh, 27 years ago when I was 20, none of you existed. You are not yet born, most of you students. Uh, but I wish I was there, I wish I was you guys today. And why I say this is because Africa is rising. You, you see Asia, Singapore, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, that's Southeast Asia. We are where Southeast Asia was 20 years ago. And Africa is a continent today that everybody wants to be in. First, it's young people like you. 60% of the world's population, youth population, is in this continent. In Kenya, 23% of Kenyans are, below ten, are between 10 and 17. And I think over 60% are below 22 years old. In Nigeria, the average age is, I think, 17. By 2050, which is just 27 years from now, which is, I'm just saying, if you're 20 at that, in your lifetime, Africa will be the largest continent by population and will have the youngest population. And those are key factors to success. Sometimes it's challenges, but let me tell you, if you see a challenge, see an opportunity to differentiate yourself, to make things okay for you. The other thing is, 16 years ago, MPESA did not exist. 16 years ago, the iOS did not exist. 10 years ago, TikTok did not exist. If you look, you guys are scholars, look at the top, the Fortune 500 companies, 30 years ago, and look at the Fortune 500 companies today. Before you would see GM, Ford, uh, what's the other companies? Chrysler, and, and so on and so forth, yeah? Big manufacturing companies. Today, which are the big companies? Apple, the largest company ever in the history, $3 trillion valuation. Microsoft, Google, Tesla, and so on and so forth. It means technology things are changing fast. And you guys are an opportunity right now to really be whoever you want to be. Yeah? So youth, technology, social media, and social commerce. I know you guys, the freelancers, I don't know, I'm sure there are freelancers here. There are people who um, are influencers. There are new jobs being created. Today in TikTok, 40% of the millennials buy live on TikTok. TikTok is something like this, eh? what's the attention span? But today, there's no difference between a kid here, a kid in Trukana, and a kid in an Ivy pre uh, school in New York. No difference. Everything is in the palm of your hands. That's the difference. And when I was walking around, campus today. I saw brands that, you know, international brands that you guys, some of you guys are wearing. I saw a Kenzo, I saw Jordan brand, I saw uh, Yeezy, Yeezy sneakers, which was a bit uh, strange to see. I saw so many things that today, you know, I was in San Francisco last week, and the same guys are wearing the same things you guys are wearing. There's no difference. And this is the power of this. Power of technology and power of the phone. My mom is 76 years old. And she's a farmer. But she spends a lot of time on YouTube understanding and learning about farming. Yeah? And of course, the biggest user of Fuliza and Mshwari, because her son works for Impressa. Uh, she in Fuliza and that, and then eventually asked me to send her money to rebalance her account. But it shows that everything is at the top, tip of your finger. I remember Jack Ma came here. So when you look at M-Pesa first, when M-Pesa started, it was the first FinTech before the word FinTech started. Yeah. We were there before iOS. So if you see Google Pay, Apple Pay, and all this, Alipay, WeChat, and so on, came from here. This is the innovation in the heartland of where a product that's made in Kenya is actually a global product. And that's the reason why I was last week sitting there because people want to see how did this happen. Yeah? And M-Pesa today 
is a magnificent product. It's actually not a product. It's, a, it's an ecosystem. So we started with a simple send money home to my person, to your mom, to a payment platform, to an ecosystem that any of you can develop products and services to serve 60 million customers without ever telling somebody to download an app. In the Mpesa app, you're able to publish your own app. We're a quote-unquote Google Play Store. So you don't have to worry about the market. The market is there. We are an ecosystem. But today I've seen companies, Twigger Foods, uh, I'm sure you guys do betting. How does betting happen without Mpesa? It doesn't. It's a, it's a billion, you know, hundreds of billions of shillings are played on betting, but it's an innovation that happened on our ecosystem. And it happens to women, we're empowering women, to kids, to education, to your school fees is paid on Mpesa. I'm sure the VC and these guys pay other services on Mpesa. But when you look at that, look at, we were always trying to, what problem are we trying to solve? So with young guys, always look at what problem are you trying to solve? Whether it was the garbage collecting, whether well, it was me not wanting to work hard, but I need my situational awareness to, to decide how, what's going to happen. But you have to know what you're trying to solve for and then what drives you, which will come to your purpose. So I cannot not talk about M-Pesa before um, uh, as I'm the CEO of M-Pesa. But it's the first time I'm presenting without wearing an M-Pesa branded shirt because today I'm not, there. I'm not, I'm not here as a CEO uh, of M-Pesa. I'm here to tell you that there are great trends, the metaverse, a lot of you guys know what's happening on the metaverse, huge, huge opportunities that are there. Everything as a service. Don't be so fixated about innovation or creating something sometimes. Look at the problem you're trying to solve, there's something called everything as a service. If I want a wealth management platform, I can get it. If I want a banking system, I can get it. So right now, you are the, with, with the tip of your hands, you can figure out where to get solutions. There's cloud technology. Pick something, add it. Let me give you an example. I mean, you guys know about Uber. Uber uses something called APIs. APIs are just connections on technology. They use the Visa API for payment. They use Google API for location services. And the entire Uber system, which is one of the largest taxi companies that doesn't own a taxi, operates on connecting APIs of third parties and put it on an app. They don't own any APIs. Simple, they have built a product. Another one that's there is Airbnb, the largest hotel without owning a single hotel. They have just connected people with the opportunity and connecting with technology for you to be able to rent a house anywhere in this world. And today, people in Kenya are making money from Airbnbs. People are making money from Booking.com. People are making money from all that. It's, you don't have to create. You have to figure out what you're trying to solve, and then now work backwards to ensure that that, that, that does happen. With regard to M-Pesa, just to give you a feel, because uh, a lot of times then people see M-Pesa uh, and don't understand what it is. As I said, it's an ecosystem that has close to 60 million customers on one side and over 5 million businesses on the other side. And from that ecosystem, we allow a lot of innovation to happen. So you guys saw the Hustler Fund being done. If I told you the Hustler Fund was built in six weeks and today has 20 million customers, from a technology standpoint, it looks almost impossible. That is because, first of all, we knew what we wanted to build and to help government, and then once we had done that front end loading, a lot of drawing, the technical build only took us six weeks to get it done. If you look at the agriculture subsidy program today that the government runs, again, run on the platform. As a farmer, you can order for fertilizer, you can pay for fertilizer, subsidized fertilizer, and today 4.5 million farmers in Kenya have used that service, and they have paid over 16 billion worth of fertilizer subsidies uh, in the platform. First time, technology. Solving a, 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 what were we trying to solve is agricultural subsidy program. After that, and work with government to, to, make it, to make it work. So in these things, it's, it's always about what are you trying to solve and then figuring out how to do it. So the government r is, runs on MPESA. 
Businesses like ABL run on m -Pesa. Small businesses run on m -Pesa. And the velocity of money that moves in the ecosystem is more than $1 billion a day on m -Pesa. That's a lot. And if you compare it with Stripe, PayPal, we are uh, as large as any global payment company worldwide. To move $360 billion in a year is not a, a mean achievement from a company that's headquartered in Kenya. Today, we do about 91 million transactions a day. That's more than MoneyGram, Western Union combined worldwide. And a lot of times, sometimes when systems don't work, and sometimes systems don't work, it reminds me of COVID, that we breathe, but until we knew COVID, we did not know how breathing was important. So m -Pesa is used until the day it stops working, and then on Twitter, everything becomes uh, a problem. So I don't like seeing m -Pesa trending, either positive or negative, uh, because it gives me uh, a bit of chills. But to be successful in what I do is based on the foundation where I started. Ingenuity, hard work, dedicated, you see opportunities, you see, figure out what you're trying to solve, and you hustle. Yeah. And, and hustling continues. You work, you're paid, you're paid to hustle. You, you know, pay me a salary at Safaricom or in West Africa. But then I can also hustle on the site. And uh, I thought for the young guys uh, who like to go out, uh, I used to own in about six or seven bars in Nairobi at one time uh, until 2015. <laughs> so if you ever went to Rafiki's uh, in Langata or Barkas in Westlands or Rafiki's in Naku and Buffet Park or Tamasha, you, you were part of the, the owners. But some of the reasons why I, I ran that business for 15 years was because of innovation. We started building bars not by looking at the decor, the who's gonna play. We started building bars by the women's toilets. So we say we're gonna make the women's toilet the cleanest, most beautiful toilet. It's there. That if somebody's driving, ladies driving, or passing somewhere, you will go to a bar. Because you know it's gonna be clean, there's somebody there, and you can take a selfie there. You know? That was how we started building bars. And we, our custom, and I'm coming to why you have to understand your custom. Our customer wasn't the guy who wants to buy drinks. We, our target addressable market was the women. So we had to make sure it's comfortable, it's clean, it's nice, it's true. If you went to the men's toilet and the women's toilet, the tissue paper was different. We had the very expensive tissue paper. There's a reason we were doing that. And if you went to watch football, Man United play Arsenal, in our bars, there would not be any volume of that game. It was very irritating to the guys who wanted, why not playing that thing? But if guys start watching football, what are the women doing? They get bored because it's noisy. So we used to put music. If you want to watch it, uh, it's on TV, but there'll be no sound. There'll be a DJ playing. So the intention is what I'm coming to is also address what's, who's your customer. For everything that we are doing, it's about a customer. Yeah? If you see how Fuliza started, Fuliza started because there was almost 50 billion shillings every year that declined because of insufficient funds. And uh, if I can embarrass my, my marketing colleagues in Safaricom, they went and said they were looking for the best name for creating Fuliza at the beginning of the overdraft solution. And they interviewed hundreds of people, focus groups, spent a lot of money. And the first name they came up for me was called, they said, this is the best, Okoa Mpesa. I said, what? Hey, Okoa Mpesa, it's like Okoa Jazzy. This, this is the one customers want. And I knew they did not know, understand the customer, despite them being the marketing guys. And I remember I went back to my days in Tanzania, where when we used to go out, we used to say, you know, Continue. Things keep moving. 
And that's how I used my veto power to call it Fuliza. And that's how it started uh, in it. So those are some of the things that really you need to understand the customer and you need to understand the problem. And if you have those two things, you'll be successful in life. So what does this mean if I start summarizing? One, hard work, dedication, and consistency will beat the most talented person in the world, the smartest guy in the room. And I'll give an example of, I think some of you guys watch basketball, I saw some of the Jordan shoes and so on. And you ask why Kobe Bryant became one of the best basketballers in it. And I study people who are successful either in business, in sports, and so on. Look at those traits. Because it's going to be hard work, dedication, consistency, and the discipline around it. So he says he used to wake up. So if you, most professional basketballers will train twice a day. Wake up at 6, by 7, 38, they'll train till 11 eat lunch, recover, then train in the afternoon, and then the day is over. And Kobe changed that. Kobe woke up at 3 in the morning and did a practice before 6. Then ate his breakfast and then did that other practice. And he finished his practice by 10. Then his, bo his body recovered. Then he did another afternoon. By 5, he's recovered again, and then he did another practice. So Kobe was doing four practices a day where every other professional guy was doing two. Over one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, no matter how talented that guy was, you will never beat Kobe Bryant in basketball because of that consistency. It adds up. And that's something you have to do in everything you do. You have to be consistent. You must be driven. Look at it. Elon Musk, the richest guy in the world. You know how many hours of work he does? 16 hours a day. There's a friend of mine called Charlie in the States, who was the head of engineering at Tesla. Kenyan guy. He said Elon Musk could stay in the, in, in, in the engineering room, building Tesla. And he could stay in a t-shirt, jeans, and a toothbrush for two to three days without going home. This is the richest guy in the world that he was trying to perfect. And when you see that, what, the outcome of that, you see Tesla, you see SpaceX, you see all these things. They don't come out by coincidence. You don't see him now was the richest man who has ever been over $200 billion. It didn't come by coincidence. Hard work, dedication, consistency. For you guys, because of that, you have to be patient. You really have to take your time and your stripes. And the other thing in this world is always add one more skill. If you're doing accounting, add computing. If you're doing something, learn something. The thing that I'm going to tell you is remain a student for the rest of your life. Don't think graduation is ending. Remain a student for the rest of your life, and that's how you're going to be one of the most successful people. Because every single day you need to learn. There's no one no, who is successful doesn't. If you look at Bill Gates, they read 30, 40 books. They're always learning. So one thing you have to do is keep learning. And as I said, remain a student. For me, who start making money, to be honest, when the parents give you, whether it's 100 shillings, 1,000 shillings, please start saving, start investing. I wish I knew this earlier. Probably I would not have gone into, into employment, given I was making a lot more money when I was younger. But if somebody had shown me to invest in the stock exchange, imagine having 3 million shillings when Kibaki became part in, 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 into presidency, the stock exchange opened. If I'd put three million shillings in the stock exchange then, it could be probably be two, three hundred million today. You know, those are the kind of things that I wish, and this comes to it, get a mentor. Talk to your friends, get good friends. Let me tell you, build networks here. The person next to you, you don't know who they're gonna be in life. Invest in people, invest in spending time and getting to know it. Build meaningful relationships. They are so important in life. Some of my some friends I've known, I've known since I was four years. We're still together. Guys of Langata, guys of the UK, build relationships because that will be very uh, important 
in India. The other thing, be transparent in your thinking. I don't know what Council Member Mariko thinks, if he doesn't tell me. Be transparent. I cannot be a leader of MPESA and not be clear on my vision. The vision for the university is very clear. It's there, and that's why I'm very happy to see there. You have to tell people. It has to be visible. What are you trying to achieve? In, your, in life, when you stand up in the morning in the mirror, what's your vision? What's your purpose? You have to keep saying it because that will drive you into something that I say, or I learned from Kipchoge. Take a lot of vitamin N. How many of you know what vitamin N is? Vitamin? No. That's the most important, one of the most important things. I learned that from Kipchoge. Hey, I mean, he's dedicated, you know, I mean, he can eat a pizza every day if he wants to, but there's vitamin N. He knows what he needs to do. If you're going to be dedicated consistency, you have to say no to certain things. If you want to be good at this, you're going to have to, you know, forego some things. Let me give you an example. Floyd Mayweather, the greatest bo uh, boxer in the history of boxing. 50 fights, zero losses. He used to be paid $300 million a year. $300 million a fight. But he lives a very flamboyant life. And everybody used to think, this guy drinks, smokes, whatever, he's partying. Never touched alcohol, never smoked. Always three kilos of, of his fight weight. He goes clubbing till three, four in the morning. He jogs back with the Rolls Royce following him. Consistency. We're able to say no. I've seen people who have met Ronaldo, footballer, and he takes them out. Everyone is on champagne and everyone is partying. He's eating a salad, or maybe a salmon. Dedicated to what he needs to continue doing as his, as his profession. He doesn't need to play football anymore. So those guys, and you can see them messy, and I say, learn about guys who've been successful and look at those traits. Don't look at the money. The money follows. It's about what happens. Your integrity and your legacy are related. You really need to be a person of integrity. Keep your word. It's very important. The other thing, there's no leader. I'm not a leader. You, everybody's a leader in everything. Whether you're a school, school um, rugby captain, whether you're a parent at home, you're a leader, whether you're a student leader, everybody's a leader, and you have to know that. And you're not depending on anybody. You have to depend on you and knowing that you're actually a leader. In conclusion, write your own obituary. Let me repeat, write your own obituary. Don't wait for guys to say who you are. Say you're a nice guy and you're not a nice guy. Huh? My achievements, CV, accolades, all these things mean nothing to me. What is important is my humanity and the legacy of doing good. That's what I want to be remembered for. Not as the CEO of M-Pesa, not as chairman of KCA, but just as a person who understood humanity and was dedicating his life to doing good. And for me, and there will be failures in life. And to be honest, if you're not failing in life, it means you're not learning. You will fail, and you will fail all the time. That is how you get up, how you learn from it, and that's what's going to drive you going forward. My last thing to you guys, as my friend, colleague, and CEO, former CEO of Safaricom, the late Bob Colimo, used to quote, he had a very famous quote, every time you see Boko, was somebody called Dr. Zeus. Dr. Zeus Horton. And he used to say this, the quote, the quote is there, a person is a person no matter how small. And I repeat, a person is a person no matter how small. And for me, that is so important about who you are and your legacy that you live. Thank you very much. appreciate our chief guest in a better way. Remember I say that we have uh, money clubs, right? But now we want to go to fireworks club. How do we do fireworks club? You clap three times, then you do like this. Shh, shh. Fireworks. One, two, three.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, our chief guest, kindly before you sit down, we want to go to the next level of uh, some questions. And then we'll uh, appreciate you again later. But for now, I uh, want to take this opportunity to welcome uh, question and answer before we proceed to the next level. Questions and answer. Uh, we may want to welcome three questions, the first round, kindly. Three first, three questions. Yes, take it up. Um, my name is Caroline Kahingo. I'm from Rezel Career Center and also a part-time lecturer here. My question is about the VUCA environment that we are dealing in an environment that is volatile and certain with a lot of ambiguity and complexity. How is the academia preparing the modern learner for such an environment because basically we want a learner, as you have highlighted from your history, a learner who is able to fit in such an environment and how do we combine um, our, our courses to fit in this environment that a student doesn't have to really uh, do become, they can maybe match that with something else like now we're talking about artificial intelligence, big data, and the internet of things. How are we prepared as uh, the university to make sure that we have a learner who is going to fit in this environment? Thank you. We, we can take two more questions, kindly. My name is Alex Were. I am a student here at Case University. I'm learning how to code by doing a Bachelor of Science in Software Development. And uh, my question is, uh, in your opinion, uh, what are some of the ethical considerations that need to guide the future uh, workplace uh, in Africa, and uh, particularly in the use of uh, AI and automating systems? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Stoyo. I am Sir Antonio Chin. I would have asked for Felisa and Chris, but apparently this is the venue. So, <laughs> thank you very much. My first question is a personal question. Can I be your friend? Can I be connected to your connections and can you be my mentor? Then, to the general question, there's a lot of uncertainty with the graduates. Yes, we are told every day to be innovative. However, the other day, the deputy president said that there are no jobs and we should be taking part in, in finding these jobs and creating them. And there's a lot of uncertainty I've been talking to comrades saying that I'm completing my degree, I'm completing my diploma, I'm completing my professional study, but I'm not sure what happens next. And this has led to, has led to social anxiety. How do you question this? Thank you very much. Okay. Wow, it's like an exam. Uh, it's a really tough questions. Uh, Caroline on VUCA. Um, it's that's, that's something that's not just for the investor. It's uncertain even for us. Um, you know, we. The only thing that uh, for us is is you set your vision, you set your strategy then you have to be adaptable. You know, 
No one ever predict, uh, predicted that the uh, Russia-Ukraine war will happen. Who knew wheat from Kenya came from Ukraine before that? You know, who knew COVID was coming? So VUCA is constant. And this happens from whether it's the government, whether it's organizations such as ourselves, whether it's uh, the university. I remember chairing uh, uh, one of the council's meetings and we were looking at the sustainability of the university. It was a real thing that could we sustain ourselves? Will this KCA university survive during COVID? But the team looked at it from an opportunity standpoint. Distance learning, you know, you, you innovate around, uh, around it. Or the, uh, we approved the audio visual place for, for lecturers to train. You guys started doing exams uh, online, you know, registrations were improving during that particular time. You know, so it's, it's, it's how you see the challenge and then take it back and say what the, what the opportunities are. Because if there are no challenges, if there are no problems, then where are the opportunities to succeed? Those difficult moments is when you'll see the, you know, you see your true self, you can either fall back and say, hey, it's, the world is dying, um, everything is, but you can actually see it as an opportunity. So adaptability is so key uh, in it and how you, you equip the students to be able to adapt. That's why I say one more skill, one more thing, build network. It's, there's no one single thing. It's a combination of very many things that make, uh, that you'll be able to uh, get the students to, to, uh, um, to excel. And then link business and the university. You know, if you look at the US, universities or UK, universities make a lot of money from research for business. Why should I use a PESA team only uh, or the developer community to develop products and services? I have 20,000 students in, in, in KCA University. Why are you not being, you know, why are, we not, why are businesses not using the universities to, to really uh, do research and innovation? And I like what Professor Nuera and the team are doing. That's why we created that, that, that uh, DVC for research. It's because we need to engage with the business. Today, you've talked about Gen AI, generative AI. Until six months ago, who knew what Gen AI was until ChatGPT came? Yeah? Today, ChatGPT can probably write a better thesis than Professor Nwera or Professor Bagak. True. I mean, it's, so why should I go to school? <laughs> you know, you know, so, so there are certain things that, you know, there's so much happening. And this relates to uh, Alex, your question on ethical AI. You know, it's just a topical debate today. How far should AI go? You know, if you look at pictures, my picture, I mean, AI can generate a visual representation of myself that looks so real today. So who am I on the internet? Am I, there are bots, there are this, I could represent, we're influencing, you know, those are hack, they can hack. Yesterday, who saw the biggest hack? Uh, you guys keep up the news. What was the hack yesterday on the former US president? Man. His son's account on, tweet, on X was hacked and said, ah, Donald Trump has died. And they didn't see it, it's in the news everywhere. But you know, AI can actually, you know, can be very disruptive, but also it's, it's, it's advancement of technology is moving so quickly, but there are things that from an ethical standpoint that are being put in place, whether by government, by companies, you can see, uh, you know, whether it's the big companies, the big tech, the Microsoft, the Google, everyone's talking about AI uh, and being responsible, customer data protection, and so on and so forth. So all these things, it's a debate, uh, Alex, and I think that debate will continue as well as AI uh, and new technologies uh, uh, continue to expand. I like his name, Sir Anthony. I'll never forget you, now you're my friend. So you can follow me on LinkedIn and yes, we can have a good conversation and have a cup of tea uh, with you. But the issue of, if you look at, why I gave my personal example, 
you know, there were no jobs waiting. Yeah? And there are no jobs. I mean, there'll be jobs that will be there, but we, there's a huge pool coming out. Let, today, there's something called a freelancer. And I'll use some of the statistics that we have. The lot of Kenyans earning a lot of money. Between us and PayPal, there's $40 million coming from PayPal to M-Pesa for freelancers. These are people working online. As you're a youthful population, and we went to the year of uh, you know, people living old, uh, longer, there are jobs that are being done remotely. Today, I can tell you from M-Pesa Africa, I've never met my entire team. I have a team in London, I have a team in Egypt, I have a team in India, I have a team in Kenya, I have a team in South Africa, I have a team in Mozambique, in DRC, but we are one company. So we're operating different. I'm recruiting people who I've never seen from different parts. Today, a developer, um, Alex, who said you can't work for Google or Apple while you're here. The world has changed. So it's ad about adapting, about looking at opportunities and seeing where best you can. Yes, job is going to be something. That's, that, that's a topical issue, for, and not only just for us, for Africa. There are very many young people. But you know, there's agriculture, there's this. There are certain things that you can leverage on technology, leverage on things to try and figure out uh, what to do. But it's a difficult question. I can only give you some of the ideas of what, what can happen, but it's a lot about it is look at these things as opportunities to create something new, to innovate as friends. You know, like where we sat down in a street in Langanta and came up with a garbage collecting company. Lots of opportunities are there. As I said, I would, I would really love to be 20 years uh, old today because I think given the opportunities that are there in your lifetime in Africa will be very great and significant. We really appreciate, thank you very much, our chief guests. Uh, honestly, you have not only spoken to our hearts, but you have mentored and inspired a good number of us here. We want to give our chief guests a standing ovation. Remember, one of the things that I could not forget this, that um, he said that um, as he was summarizing this, one of them, that hard work, dedication, and consistency. You should not forget that. If you forget the rest, then that one is the most important that you should not forget. Of course, they said very many other important elements that you should not forget in your life, that everybody is a leader, regardless of where you are. Let's appreciate and give him a standing ovation. Kindly let's stand and give him a standing ovation, and we give him money clap. The money clap, you remember that? Yes, let's practice that. One, two, three. Once again. Thank you very much. We really appreciate. Meanwhile, you stand there so that we can appreciate you more. We are calling our VC and CEO, KCA University, to come and gift our chief guests. Thank you very much. At that point in time, I'm requesting our DVCs present to come and take that photo. Kindly, our DVCs, kindly uh, come for Just, just uh, uh, thanks, VC. Uh, when I was out there, I uh, realized uh, you guys use a lot of Wi-Fi. So uh, we'll be donating uh, 300,000 worth of cash of airtime for the students for, for my Wi-Fi. <laughs> For that, and because I when I was there, I missed a seat. Uh, all the seats were taken, so we'll be looking at donating more chairs uh, from a personal capacity for me and my friends uh, for the university. So thank you very much. Let's appreciate him once again in a better way with a standing ovation 
with those appreciation that he has said that he's going to do. Let's appreciate him. Let's appreciate him. And we said money clap, right? One, two, three. Once again, one, two, three. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's take that photo then. Uh, the final photo will be our UMB to join the group later so that we can have a final photo at that point. Kindly, UMB, be ready for that photo. UMB present? UMB members? You can smile, just smile. Say money. 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 Very good. <laughs> thank you very much, I really appreciate. Uh, thank you for thank you. that patience there, thank you very much. We are almost come to the tail end of this program today and uh, it's time for, uh, we are going to have refreshments at the tram out there as we also network and uh, say hello. This is one of the opportunity you are going to have to meet and greet the managing director in PESA Africa. Remember, I must have told you it's Africa. So we really appreciate you and uh, guests who live at their own leisure. So we'll give them opportunity to get out and then we meet out there at the tram. Then we come to the end of this program. Thank you very much. I welcome you once again to KC University for those who have come here for the first time and all our online viewers, we really appreciate you. May God bless you, may God be with you and thank you for attending or participating. Thank you very much.